Live Network. This is Inside Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm News Channel 5's political analyst, Pat Nolan. Welcome to Inside Politics. The nation, indeed, the world has just observed the 50th anniversary of the death of President John F. Kennedy. What is the legacy of JFK and particularly his role in American and political history? I want to talk today with John Sigenthaler about that. John, of course, is renowned for his career in journalism, both with the Tennessee and with USA Today. But no one in this area knew the Kennedys better than John did. John, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Pat, for having me. Now, there's a remarkable poll that just came out that Gallup did, and they've done this several times before. John Kennedy's performance rating as president is still considered 74% either above average or great by American people. There's no other president in modern times, and that's Eisenhower Ford that's even close to that. What's going on there? Well, I just think the fact of who he was and how he was, um, stunningly attractive, stunningly intelligent, stunningly articulate. Uh, he made such an impact uh, the short time that we had him as president. And then to have that bright light snuffed out uh, by an assassin's bullet shocked us, and I think Subsequent generations, uh, children, um, I talk in classes now to children, and I say, everybody can remember where he or she was, and all of a sudden I realize, these kids don't understand that. Um, they don't remember, but uh, they, they some, remember what their parents told seen them. seen some numbers that say only a third of Americans alive today were alive when John Kennedy was president. I think so that's is, exactly is this right. something to do with maybe what they've read, what, what a lot of us have read well, in Well, it certainly has to do with the imagery, uh, but it also has to do that, uh, with the fact that the imagery reflects how he was. I mean, he was a unique and different politician. Well, there's so many things about President Kennedy in his personal life at that time and in his medical life in terms of some of the problems that he had that people didn't know at the time. They know them all now, yet his numbers stay pretty high. Why don't these blemishes create a problem for him the way they do? Well, I think President particularly Nixon? with regard to his medical uh, situation, part of it was, um, was his health. Um, he suffered from, from uh, that disease and had to take medication for it. But part of it was that he had been badly injured in World War II and Hero, I mean, even though injured, saved um, fellow sailors' lives. And I think that was part of it. And, and, and a lot of it um, adds to sort of a mystique about him, but the reality is that, um, that his life was snuffed out before he had the opportunity to prove how great he really could be. Now, uh, the president had some a little bit of up and down during that time. When he first came into office, you had the Bay of Pigs invasion, which was a disaster militarily and otherwise. There was also the first summit that he had with Khrushchev in Vienna, which went very badly for the young president. Would you say, looking at his administration, that he was somebody who benefited as he got in from some on-the-job training and got better as his first term? I would off? say that the Bay of Pigs was a, a severe blow to him. Um, but the interesting thing about the Bay of Pigs is immediately he said the buck stops here it's my fault that it did not succeed and he went through that period in which he tried to liberate those Cuban nationals who were captured you remember John J Hooker from Nashville went down to Florida for the president to negotiate the release of those prisoners and um, so the Bay of Pigs was a disaster as you say but he recovered from it quickly and and uh, he was not satisfied with the meeting with Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev was brusque and bluff and gruff and sought to intimidate him. I don't think he was intimidated at all, but I think he always felt that the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was the critical moment in his presidency, um, I always thought he felt that the, that, that the Cuban Missile Crisis came about as a result of that first meeting with Khrushchev. He came away with that and Khrushchev thought, I can bluff him, I can move on him, and of course he couldn't. Well, let's talk a little bit just for a second about the Cuban Missile Crisis. No American president has gotten closer to nuclear war than they did during those days. Did you ever talk with the president or with his brother Bobby Kennedy, since they were the two people most involved, about how they came about to decide which one of the messages from the Soviets they were going to respond to, because it could have gone either way. Well, you know, Bob has written about it extensively in 13 days, and we talked about it. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, I, I don't know that I've told this story, it's in my oral history, but I got a call from Robert Kennedy, and um, we talked about uh, how, how, uh, how stupid it was for Khrushchev to trust Castro 
Uh, and during that conversation, he said to me, you know, you should get your relatives away from the Gulf Coast. They may be strafing. He f knew that he was being monitored. And I later found out that he had called about four people, none of whom had relatives in the Gulf Coast, but saying, get your, pe get your relatives out of the Gulf Coast. I mean, they thought we were on the cusp of war. And, um, and you know, when Dean Rusk said the other fellow just blinked, they were also glad that they hadn't listened to the military hawks who were saying, bomb Havana, bomb Havana, bomb Havana. He was cool, calm, collected. I think that he was a hero in war. He understood what war meant, um, and he didn't want to go there. And so they, after that first message, they held back and waited. And as we say, Dean Rusk said, the other guy just blinked. Uh, when the president went to Dallas, his poll numbers were as low as they were during his entire administration. They were down all the way to 58 percent, which most presidents have been lucky to be that high. But uh, what was going on there? Was he concerned about that? About what was he trying to do to try to turn I don't think so, but already, you know, politicians uh, who run for high office get elected and they immediately think about re-election. And um, this was a year away, but this was really the first trip of the campaign. And it was going to start in Texas. Um, the administration really would not have succeeded had it not been for Texas and Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson on that ticket meant that we carried most of the southern states. At that point, Lyndon Johnson was considered sympathetic to segregation, you know. And so, without talking about that, he joined the ticket and Kennedy carried the South um, eight of the 13 states. And the trip to Texas probably also sent the message <laughs> that Johnson would be on the ticket. In and we're going to go again and we're going together. And all this talk about somebody, many so-called experts have said he would have replaced Lyndon Johnson the second term. No way that would have happened. I mean, uh, he had confidence in Johnson as a, as a, uh, as a leader. And, um, and, and the truth of that is they were closer than anybody knew. John Sigathal is our guest. We're talking about the legacy of President John F. Kennedy not long after the 50th anniversary of his assassination. Our conversation continues after this message, after these messages.